Welcome everyone um, to this session on health, equity, and climate change in the classroom. My name is Oliver Lane. I'm the manager for teaching and learning at the UBC Sustainability Hub. I wanna thank the CTLT for hosting so many learning opportunities actually so over the years. Um, and in particular today, in particular today for the opportunity to share with you um, our perspectives on teaching health, equity, and climate change at UBC. There we go. Um, I'm joining you today from uh, Muskiam unceded traditional and ancestral lands where the UBC Vancouver campus is located. Um, I'm an immigrant to these lands. I, I arrived from Argentina and South America about 14 years ago from a region that was inhabited and stewarded uh, for hundreds of years by the Querandíes and Tehuelches indigenous peoples. And I'd never really looked into whose lands I'd grown up on not until I came to Vancouver and started to learn about um, Coast Salish people and other indigenous peoples in Canada, about the history and, and the impact of colonialism and the efforts for reconciliation that are underway. And, and as I started to get more involved in climate change and sustainability work, uh, the responsibility of, of acknowledging whose lands we are on and keeping this front and center of the work that we do became even more of a priority for me. And, and I know for a lot of my colleagues, and this is for many reasons, including, including that indigenous people have been stewarding these lands and these natural ecosystems for millennia, but also because we know that climate change is impacting uh, marginalized groups and vulnerable groups in our societies. And we know that a lot of indigenous um, communities are suffering severe impacts already of the changing climate. So um, this, is why, this is why this is particularly important when we talk about these topics, in, in my opinion. So if you, if you're, I invite you, if you want to, to share in the chat where you are joining from, whose lands you're on. Um, one of the resources that we recommend is nativeland.ca. That's native-land.ca. It's a global world map where you can find the different indigenous territories around the world. So the agenda for today, um, we are doing the, I'll do the introductions in, in a minute. I'll talk about, very briefly about the Sustainability Hub, the group that I represent on campus and the work that we do and how we support faculty. And then I'll introduce you to our, our speakers, our passionate, dedicated faculty members that are tackling this, this work and on this topic of health equity and climate change in the classroom. We'll have some, some questions for the panel and some questions from the audience as well for them. You can share those questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand once I'll, I'll, I'll let you all know when we get started with, the, with that section. Towards uh, 2.45, we hope to be closing, having some closing comments and I'll share some resources uh, in particular for teaching um, that might be useful to you. And we should be done by, by 3 p.m. So very quickly, a bit about the Sustainability Hub. You might have heard, we, we changed our name about a year ago. It used to be called the Sustainability Initiative. We are a non-academic unit on the Vancouver campus that supports students, faculty, staff, and the UBC community in general to advance UBC's sustainability and climate action goals. We are located in the SIRSP building, the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability. That's on West Mall. Um, we offer a range of supports, including curriculum development grants to faculty, research grants as well. We host networking events with a special focus on getting people from across disciplines to connect and to explore shared interests and share opportunities. Um, we support students as well, in developing leadership opportunities for them and with them. We host the climate emergency team in our unit and support their work um, across campus as well. And we develop resources that are available for, uh, as I say, for students, for staff, for faculty, and the community in general. And something very important to mention is that most of the work that we do is in partnerships. We collaborate with different units, with departments, um, with student groups across campus to deliver the programming that we deliver. So if you're interested in learning more about the work that you do, you can visit us at sustain.ubc.ca or you can send me an email directly and we'll be happy to support your work. I'm also curious to see um, from the audience if this is a topic that you've already been engaged with, 
you've been working on or is this completely new maybe so maybe in the in the chat if you could just say new for example type in new if this is totally new for you or already engaged um or already working on this if if this is something that you've been exploring for some time just for us uh, especially for the for the panelists to get a sense of who's in the room let's see don't be shy Okay, we have uh, Jenna just starting to explore this topic over this year. Yeah, I feel I feel a lot of people have heard about this topic, but just maybe not sure how to engage with it. Somebody with some more experience, three or four years working on this. Well, great, thank you for, for sharing that. So we probably have a mix of people who are really enthusiastic about it but are finding looking for ways to get engaged people who have already been exploring this for for some times somebody here researches this topic and interested in those already teaching this intersection it's great okay so i hope you feel inspired um, by our presenters today three of them are engaged with the sustainability hub in different ways and i'll very quickly mention that once once i introduce you to them so I think we'll get started. Um, I'll introduce uh, one at a time and give them seven or eight minutes uh, to talk about their work and their perspectives on this topic. I'll start with, uh, I, I wanna welcome Raluca, Radu, uh, Adrian Yi, and Peter Berman. And thank you for joining us. It is really an honor to have you with us sharing your time at a busy end of the year. So um, really glad to, to have you here, and I hope everybody benefits from, from your experience. I'm going to introduce uh, Raluca first, and then uh, give the floor to her. So Ms. Radu is a lecturer at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing in Vancouver. In this role, she teaches within the Bachelor of Science in Nursing in the Nursing Program, and leads a Health Impacts of Climate Change course taught to undergraduate students from diverse professional disciplines. Ms. Rado also serves as an active member of the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment and the national, at the national and provincial levels. On an international scale, she is involved with the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education Nursing Working Group and has been instrumental in advancing knowledge situated at the intersection of climate change and human health as a result of her involvement in the academic and NGO sectors. Ms. Rado focused her graduate studies on integrating climate change into nursing education. And she created a tool that can be used by educators in both clinical and university settings to teach an introductory, introductory level session on climate change and health with specific links to nursing practice. This, I understand this educational tool uh, on climate change and nursing education is available to download at UBC's open library. And I think we can share that um, link. I have it here, let me see if I can do this. I'll put it in the chat if you're interested in this resource that Raluca has developed. And as I mentioned, uh, the three panelists are linked to the Sustainability Hub. Raluca was a climate education grant recipient in uh, 2021, which is a grant we offer through the hub to support the enhancement of existing courses by adding climate, re climate change related content to them. The name of her project for this grant was Enriched Learning Through an Interactive Case-Based Online Module, Nursing 290, Health Impacts of Climate Change. Okay, and over to you, Raluca. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so we can see more faces. And it's, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much, Oliver. And thank you, CTLT, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, just having the opportunity to share a little bit about my work at UBC in the last two and a half years. Have been very busy years. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge and give uh, gratitude and thanks that I give every day uh, for joining you from the Musqueam Nation of unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam peoples here in Vancouver. Uh, I am a very proud uh, lecturer at the UBC School of Nursing and I'm a registered nurse by background. Um, so for me, this specific topic, uh, when I was assigned to the climate change course, when I started working at UBC in the fall of 2020, I was ecstatic because as you, as you learned from Oliver, uh, my uh, graduate studies focused on uh, developing this tool that essentially focused on how much you can condense in about a four hour 
uh, session that you could disseminate as much information as possible about the health impacts of climate change. And from that, uh, starting in the nursing training course, which is offered as an, an elective offered by the BSN program, but to non-nursing students. Uh, so a lot of my students come from uh, diverse backgrounds, all the way from kinesiology to chemistry to arts, psychology, first year all the way through to graduate. And I've also had actually retired individuals during the course. So it's, it's a very diverse course because um, you first have a cohort of students who come from these backgrounds, which make it very enriching, uh, especially in the sphere of climate change education. And then secondly, uh, the core focus of the course is on the health impacts of climate change. So in my first term, um, when I, I want to give a little bit of history as to where uh, how I came about to doing this work and being su a successful recipient of the grant. Um, in 2020, in the fall semester, I was teaching a course using the Planetary Health Alliance case studies, uh, which is a resource I strongly recommend to people to become familiar with if you're new, especially to the sphere, um, because their case studies are essentially uh, focused on different parts of from around the world, and um, they're very community-based, and they touch upon uh, equity, they touch upon health impacts, they discuss infrastructure. So I was fascinated by actually using them in the classroom to support students to learn from a more problem-based approach. Uh, I really do believe that, that and I'm going to be talking a lot about this throughout today. And so in my second term, as I was wrapping up the semester and I saw the opportunity to apply for this grant, I thought that it would be even more powerful for future nursing to 90 students to have exposure to a, um, a local kind of example, uh, but talking about a globally shared problem, so climate change. And so the main goal of my project was essentially to pull together a resource that was built in the shape of a case study similar kind of format to the Planetary Health Alliance case studies, but to a much smaller scale, given the uh, resources uh, of myself and a research assistant working on this. And um, it was basically to focus on a problem-based approach to select a uh, climate change exacerbated uh, event. So in this case, it was wildfires uh, for British Columbia with a particular focus um, on the location of Lytton uh, which coincided with uh, the heat dome of 2021 uh, that we've experienced. And so it was a journey of discovery. There was a lot of consultation with many different people from uh, BC and from across Canada because I was on the search for a case study that was ideally still existent um, to speak about the health impacts. And most of the case studies that I came across from a Canadian context at that time, I would say that the interface and the literature has changed a lot in the last year and a bit. Uh, the case studies were a lot more focused on discussing infrastructure, on discussing kind of what has happened to the people's homes. Um, it was covering a lot of important ground, but I was seeing the health aspect missing. So that's kind of what was the main driver of my work to, to get me to bring the health concept forward, tie it into a local example uh, so that students can see that climate change related events don't just happen uh, through the examples that they were getting from the Planetary Health Alliance that were more global, but looking more uh, locally to see what's going on in British Columbia. So I would say that overall, um, and I'm, I'm going to go into more details, of course, with more questions that come up. Uh, I would say that the last year and a bit has been a very transformative for me as an educator to see how students are able to connect the theory that they receive in the course on various health impacts, and they connect it to this case study that's that's very experiential. It gets them to really think critically. It gets them engaged with the social determinants of health, which are at the core driving uh, all the questions that they're being assigned to. And also it gets them to work with each other, which is again, another critical component, that of making sure that we promote interdisciplinary collaboration, which I would argue is probably one of the key factors that that helps drive our work in the climate change sphere forward. Um, so I wanted to essentially give students the taste, uh, a little bit of that taste uh, through this case study. Um, and so I am just actually, as I'm, I'm speaking right now, I'm in the process of waiting for the press books um, uh, process to uh, make this case study as an open education resource uh, that can be essentially adapted into other classrooms. So I will definitely be looking forward to sharing the resource with all of our 
and the CTLT when it's ready to go as a public link. But that's a little bit about my story. Thank you, Raluca. Um, very exciting work, and, and I, I've known about your work for, for some time now. Um, re really exciting, and, and congratulations for all that huge effort, and for engaging students as well in the work, um, and helping you do the work. Okay, um, and we'll definitely have questions for you, but we'll we'll jump now to, to Adrian um, for his introduction. Dr. Adrian Yi is the current director of curriculum with the undergraduate, uh, undergraduate medical education program at the UBC Faculty of Medicine since 2018. He provides leadership for this program to ensure high quality education experience across all four sites and all four years of the curriculum. Dr. Yi completed his MD at the University of Toronto and his, inter his internal medicine clinical hematology training at the University of Alberta. He is a practicing hematologist in Victoria. Previous educational leadership roles in the Faculty of Medicine have included Assistant Dean, Island Medical Program and Associate Director, Curriculum Years 3 and 4, and he completed a Master's of Educational Technology at UBC in 2021. He is the recipient of a Professional Development Grant from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons at, and the Principal Investigator of Educational Grants to co-create curricula with patients and caregivers. And as Raluca, Adrian was also a climate education grant recipient, this time in early uh, 2022. And the name of his project for this grant was Partnering with Patients and Caregivers to Develop Planetary Health Curriculum for the Doctor of Medicine program. Adrian, over to you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, it's such a privilege to um, present the work that we have done. I'm going to project my PowerPoint. And thank you for the wonderful introductions. Um, my name is Adrian Yi. I uh, am a practicing hematologist on the unceded and traditional territories of the Songhe, Esquimo, and Waisanish. It is such a privilege for me to live and raise my family on the territories. Um, my family came from Hong Kong to Vancouver uh, when I was 11. I then, uh, that's where I did my high school, followed by university in Ontario. Uh, what I am going to present today is the work that was actually done by our wonderful students, uh, Crystal and Jana. And Crystal and Jana, Crystal is in year two of our program and Jana is in year three of our program. And they have done so much work in championing the integration of planetary health into our curriculum. And before all of you join us, I realize that this event actually coincide with COP15. And when I was reading the paper today, that quote actually came about uh, on the newspaper. Our lives are at stake as indigenous people and the health of the planet. And that was by Jennifer Copers. That is one of the delegates from the Filipino uh, indigenous community at the COP15 meeting. So it really adds a lot of meaning to me to come and talk about how we see planetary health and why this is important and what we're gonna do about that and how we're gonna approach this critical theme in the education. So what are the backgrounds? As Raluca pointed out that um, there has been a mounting um, interest and pressure on variety of education programs to integrate planetary health. And we see that as citizens of the province and also as a practicing health professional from um, the heat dome, flooding, so on and so forth, we can actually see the impact has come a lot faster and a lot more drastic than we expected. So there has been mounting interest of our student body or the student leadership to integrate planetary health. So in 2020, uh, we have a group of students came forward. Uh, what they have done is we support them with one of the project is to integrate a student-led symposium on planetary health. So we invited Dr. Courtney Howard, Dr. Melissa Lamb, and Dr. Mary Kessler to really present their perspective on planetary health. It was amazingly received by the whole student body. I think about 500 people turn up for the sessions. Um, most of you probably know who they are. Uh, Courtney Howard is a fantastic physician, and that was a, also a candidate for the Green Party. Melissa Lamb is a family physician in Vancouver, 
and she actually worked on the, the what we call the outdoor prescriptions. And Dr. Kessler is one of our clinical faculty in infectious disease, and she has been teaching on for our program for a very long time. So they presented their ideas, their change and call to action to the class. Following that in 2021, we were able to uh, secure the grant from UBC Sustainability and to engage Jana and Crystal to start working on the design of the curriculum. So what we did is a framework of uh, multiple steps. We first look at the many strategic plans, look at the uh, Northern Ontario School of Medicine on the report of planetary health and how do they see that, the College of Family Practice about their vision of planetary health and the Medical Council of Canada. We then work with the Patient Community Partnership for Health, so PCPE, uh, what they do is they engage the community members and then we invite them to provide their perspective. We also invite representatives from non-governmental organizations. What we have learned is this is a very complicated subject. They are interconnected with public health, indigenous cultural safety, well-being, emergency medicine, and primary care. The list just go on and on. And more importantly, we the recently publication of the Okanagan Charter. And we also realized that planetary health is actually aligned very well with the well being vision. So, this is what we learned from our focus group. I think the key one that I get out of is the, at the one o'clock, the indigenous knowledge. And that is one that we stress a lot in our curricular design because you can't possibly talk about planetary health without talking about indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous connections to the community and the land. And we also talk a lot about the intersectional, you know, the intersectionality with uh, uh, EDI, with diversity and inclusion and belonging, and also with public health and many other aspects of health and well-being. I think one of the quotes from the, the focus group that really strike me is, as a physician, you cannot do a good job understanding the human body unless you understand the context. So this is what we do as for the, for the MD program. We really try to convey that um, individual that are graduating from our physician is a holistic clinician and really being able to see things in context rather than just focusing on the disease. So what are our curricular objectives? So these are the five objectives that we highlighted are the high priority for us to integrate into our curriculum. Communications. So one of the key themes that arise is the climate change anxiety. And this is a huge problem, a huge issue in the community. I think as graduates, we expect them to be able to communicate to patients and the communities how changing climate will impact their health recognizing the interconnections with nature, biodiversity, human health, and the planet, and drawing from indigenous knowledge, and to explain the intersectionality. We recognize that planetary health is not an isolated determinant of health, but one that interacts with many multiple socioeconomic determinants of health. Develop management plan, and this is one of the key parts that came out loud and clear, is we want our our graduate to be able to manage if there is a climate related disaster in, in, in the healthcare system. Sustainable practices of healthcare system need to change. Uh, what some of the practices that we have is not sustainable. And we want our graduate to be change agent and being able to work with the system to move forward to a system that is far more patient friendly and also more sustainable. So what are the lessons that we learned with the project? Uh, as with any other change project, the first step is articulate the rationale of curricular change clearly. I think some of you that are with the MD program, you know that our curriculum is really dense over the four years. We have to prioritize. So one of the key recipe of success is we need to be clear about the rationale, align with the institutional strategic plan, so our plan aligned with the UBC strategic plan, faculty of medicine strategic plan, and the indigenous strategic plan. Be very inclusive about the diverse perspective. Um, this topic, it's very diverse. There are many, many, many perspectives. 
And one of the fun part is engage our learner, actually change the project to be a learner-led uh, initiative. And it's so inspiring for me to be able to work, work with Jenna and Crystal to see that the, the work they do and how forward thinking they are. So what are our next steps? Uh, we'll create some of the curriculum materials to support our faculty that teach in the lecture. Uh, we'll start integrating planetary health into case-based learning. So case-based learning is where they tackle a clinical problem in year one, year two. So with the facilitator, with the tutor, this is where constructivism happens, where active learning happens. So we want to integrate into the CBL. And the last step is when we talk to Raluca and your colleague, and really want to start to expand and collaborate with other health professional program. And I want to thank UB Sustainability, the PCPE, and also my colleagues. Uh, without them, we would not be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, that sounds like so much work um, and, and, and having to work with so many different groups and really make it interdisciplinary and involving students. So. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions of how how you managed to move to move ahead um, effectively in that. So, um, if you have any questions in your mind already, feel free to put them in the chat or, or have them ready. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Peter Berman, and then we'll jump into um, some questions after we hear from Peter's vast experience in in this in this area. Um, so, Professor Berman is a health economist with almost 50 years of experience in research, policy analysis and development, and training in education and global health. He is professor at the School of Population and Public Health at UBC, where he was also director from 2019 to 2021, and adjunct professor in global health at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in Harvard, where he was on faculty as professor until 2019. His current research at UBC focuses on key factors affecting government decision-making, in response to public health crises. He has also been closely engaged in health systems research in Ethiopia since 2012. He is affiliated as an adjunct professor at the Public Health Foundation of India in New Delhi, and as an advisor to the China National Health Development Research Center for Healthcare Financing and Health Accounts. He was a founding faculty director of Harvard, Harvard's Chan's Doctor of Public Health degree. He is also editor-in-chief of World Scientific Publication Series on Global Health Economics and Public Policy and author or editor of six books on global health economics and policy and more than 60 academic papers in this field. And Peter is also related to the Sustainability Hub in a slightly different way. He's a Sustainability Fellow with us, so that's a two-year program and is a recipient of a Sustainability Education Grant um, in, and works in partnership with another faculty uh, member, Vina Sridham, who couldn't join us today from a, from a different faculty. So Peter, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Oliver. And I assume you can hear me all right? Yes? Okay, great. Good, well, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I am speaking to you today from the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Musqueam people near the UBC campus. Um, and I do want to emphasize, as Oliver said, that the work I, I want to share with you briefly today uh, is, was very much done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Veena Sriram, who is a faculty member in global health policy at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, as well as the School of Public Health, Population and Public Health. Um, so Veena and I set out uh, about a year and a half or two years ago to develop a new undergraduate course linking together understanding of health systems in the global context with how policies were developed and, uh, and implemented in the global health context. Um, and this has turned into an undergraduate course, uh, which we've now offered twice. And as we were developing this course, we came across the opportunity to uh, build in a more substantive uh, element of the course around sustainability and climate change. And I think I would add another term to our vocabulary here, resilience, and to th think about how to place this within a course on health systems and policy in a way that would both expand the horizons of thinking about those subjects for undergraduates, but also would create some learning materials that could, uh, if we're successful, 
Uh, this is work in progress, but if we are completely successful, provide an example of how learning materials from the experiences of the global South could, it, could inform students in Canada and how learning materials about Canada on this subject could inform students in the global South. So we were hoping for a real exchange of learning and experience. Um, now, in, in taking this forward and thinking about today's title, uh, I, I do want to emphasize that health, equity, and sustainability, resilience, and climate change were all words that were in our minds and which we tried to touch on in this course. The, one of the most striking things about teaching about health in um, the rest of the world, and especially in the global south, is the huge inequity that occurs in the world today. And this is a topic that um, is very disturbing for students to learn about when they really confront the hard numbers about causes of death um, and the very high preventable mortality, morbidity, and disability that occurs in lower and middle income countries compared to what we experience in Canada. But also within countries, within low and middle income countries and within Canada, these disparities also exist. So equity was really central to learning about health, health systems, and health policy. And in, in developing this course, we touch not only on the more technical aspects of health systems, but we touch on some of the dynamics of how issues get attention in different environments and how inequities can be reproduced through the biases in uh, voice and issue attention that occur through power relationships, through the structures of governance and so on. And, uh, and we touch on this in both the, the lower and middle income countries in, uh, in mainly in the global south, but also in Canada. And one of the interesting things we've observed in doing this course is that many of our students at UBC um, are uh, young people who are either uh, coming to Canada to study or are relatively new uh, arrivals in Canada in terms of their families. And they are curious as much about the issues of equity and resilience and sustainability in the Canadian health system as they are about that in other countries. And so we have found we had to introduce that as well. Now, in order to move forward on the sustainability and climate change side, what we've done is we've created uh, two additional modules in the course, which emphasize um, uh, both the impacts of uh, sustainability on health systems. That is that health systems are big contributors to, to the um, factors that are causing climate change, as well as uh, systems uh, that are being affected by climate change. And one of the cases that we've developed uh, working with a colleague in the Philippines looks at how rural communities in the Philippines, which face very severe challenges uh, from storms, from flooding, from other environmental changes that are linked to climate change, how they are organizing themselves to cope with these uh, threats and also to sustain the healthcare delivery systems that they value and want to keep in good condition in the face of these threats. Um, and this illustrates, I think, the more directly the climate change to health bi-directional linkage. Uh, health systems to climate change, climate change to health systems, if you will. Um, the second case that we've been working with colleagues uh, here in Vancouver and at the School of Population and Public Health has to do more with resilience and sustainability and examining the experience um, during the COVID-19 pandemic of the services that were that had been developed and created uh, for some of the very vulnerable populations in British Columbia, especially in the downtown east side uh, around uh, dr drug use and so on, and how COVID-19 interrupted in many ways the sustainability of these programs with severe outcomes for some of the most vulnerable populations. Um, most generally the populations 
that are suffering from drug use issues, but especially indigenous populations as well, who are particularly uh, suffering from this. And these two cases, uh, which bring together some video um, uh, material, some uh, interviews with some of the key actors in these programs, both abroad and here in British Columbia, we hope are going to become materials that can be used in a sustainable way in educating our own students about this, but also can be used in in education in courses in the Global South uh, that will illustrate that sustainability issues are not only problems of the Global South, but that they are problems of the North as well. So let me stop there, Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That's that's great. Also incredible amount of work and experience from, from around the globe. I'm interested also definitely in the topic that you mentioned, how how students are maybe stunned when they see all these all these numbers and they're not only numbers of each number has a story of course but it must be overwhelming um and that's maybe a question that I that I have for all of you uh but I just want to see first if if people from the audience have any questions that you want to ask our panelists right now feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand I think I can see you all in gallery view here if you have a question please go ahead don't be shy. Okay, as you as you continue to think about some questions, I'm sure you have questions. I'll just jump in with with one about how do you how do you manage a classroom environment to to make it to make it a safe and supported space for students to engage with this content that is, I'm for sure overwhelming in many different ways. And I, I'm not gonna just any of you who wants to jump in to to answer this. Well, I, if Oliver, I don't mind taking a first crack at this because this was very much on our minds uh, in delivering and developing and delivering this course. Um, I think, and we do start off the course talking about colonial history and some of the very disturbing um, elements of how we got to where we are today <laughs> with the disturbing facts that we live with today. Um, you know, we, we do um, in advance uh, advise students that some of this material is going to be very disturbing. Um, and we also uh, recognize um, during the course that uh, inequity is a very big part of uh, what we are teaching about um, and, uh, and are very concerned that students not see the world entirely in a negative or uh, even uh, hopeless uh, framing. And so we make explicit efforts in some of our sessions to um, talk about the positives. And there are many positives in the global health scene. Um, the, the sort of the takeaway uh, statement that I think we like to make is that despite all the challenges, the last 50 years have seen greater progress in global life expectancy than any period of time in human history almost. And this is evidence of some positives. And also uh, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't see the climate change question as a, as a source of uh, only negative um, experience or future. And we try to find that balance. Um, hopefully we do. And I think, think some of that is the also conveying the joy and the privilege of being able to work on these issues in a world where we envisage positive change going forward. Let me be quiet after that. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to add on to uh, uh, what Dr. Berman said that, um, you know, I would say that as a, as a nurse, when I start the class, uh, the beginning of the course in the first week, um, I, I love the fact that I can teach the class in the position of being a nurse, but then being in interaction with students who are not necessarily in health professional streams. Um, so I really just want to emphasize this to the audience that, as you see here, are health professionals or people who are studying health related topics. And I think, as I mentioned in the chat, I really do think that we have a really important position, which means that you have a certain, like you should use that position to enact change in a positive means. And so I, I try to do that by setting the tone right at the beginning um, of the term. And um, one of the things that I also add is, uh, 
for, for the course that's been very helpful uh, is structuring the course with time for reflection. And that time for reflection is uh, comes in the form of asynchronous activities for the students. So for instance, just to give an example that might be helpful in your practice um, is that on a Monday, I would teach, let's say about air quality, uh, respiratory health, uh, wildfires, and I will go into the actually introducing the case study itself. And then the students then have that reflective piece at home where they, they go home and they have an, an assigned discussion where they are uh, to answer questions, not only that gets their critical thinking with respect to what their own perspectives are on that topic, but also actually stimulates them to go retrieve literature that is recent, peer reviewed, and kind of balance out their perspectives as they're supported by the literature. And so through this, um, they kind of become immersed in a very reflective, critical thinking exercise uh, that carries throughout and builds upon, like every topic builds upon each other so that when they come to the case study assignment, they are actually able to piece um, their capacity to analyze what the literature is saying, but also with their capacity to come up with upstream solutions that take into account health equity, that take into account various components of the social determinants of health, especially the, depending on the context of their focus, especially for their group presentation. Um, and the other thing to mention is, um, I, I have actually more, two more exam examples that I've set aside. Uh, positive storytelling is definitely one of the ones that I think is really critical, not focusing on the, on the doom and gloom. Um, but also, encourage, like, I encourage anybody who has the capacity to teach about this, to adopt different modes of learning um, that actually meet different learning styles. So people might be really good at exams, some might be really good in the written format, and others are really good at presentations. And so if you're able to tap into those, then all the students have a different way to feel empowered in how they share their learnings contributions to the classroom. And the last point I wanted to make uh, with respect to how I believe like through the course and also through this case study, um, but altogether, the way that I've developed the course, I've been very intentional about building in uh, time to have guest speakers who are either from the Sustainability uh, Hub's Climate Teaching Connector, which I've been very uh, much uh, an avid user of, and I've been advocating for it and, and sharing that resource with everybody across the campus, but also having speakers uh, from outside of UBC. So for instance, this, this term I've had an entire week dedicated to indigenous sovereignty topics. And one of the students is a one who's graduating. She's an amazing indigenous student, Atlanta Grant, who talked about food sovereignty for indigenous peoples. And then the second group of people was a indigenous youth who came to speak about the TMX pipeline and just in general, what those kind of um, very uh, devastating projects have, what kind of impacts they have for the communities uh, through which they're built. Um, similarly, I will have had an entire week dedicated to upholding and promoting mental health, which coincided with uh, UBC's um, a Thrive Month in November. So it's just bringing in additional voices outside of myself who really can speak about the work that they're doing in the field and with the communities, because I've noticed that at the end of the term, students feel very empowered from the stories, especially the stories that are the positive stories that come in through the course um, and they get to essentially apply the nuances that they learn from the theory of the course with the practical based uh, examples from uh, at least I've tried to keep as local as I can. So this is a strong, I definitely have this as a strong suggestion for anyone is that you have to, you have to bring in all those voices and you have to create the platforms for those stories to be shared. And I'll stop there. Adrian, do you have any thoughts on that? I see Ainsley has a question. Is that a question specific for what Raluca just said or? <laughs> it's, well, I guess it's more of a general question. So I, I, I can wait if necessary. Adrian, do you want to jump into? Yeah, I, I don't have anything detailed to add uh, from what Raluca and Peter have talked about really in details about their approaches. But one thing I've learned as an educator is the culture of the program really matters, especially when you are having a discussion with your learners about what I call critical topic, controversial topic. One of the culture that we embrace is humility. Humility means that from the level of the leadership, faculty and learner, we are actually here to learn. We'll never be perfect. You do not need to be perfect to be a physician, but you need to 
be on the journey of lifelong learning. So we'll make mistakes along the way, but this is a journey. So we really stress that in any of the conversation that we have around topic like planetary health, EDI, anti-racism, so on and so forth. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Ainsley, go ahead. And I have two questions in the chat that I will bring up later. Um, I guess what's coming to my mind is um, is an experience that I had in taking um, a degree as a teacher <laughs> um, and then going out into the real world, you know, and, and exploring all these wonderful ideas in university and then going out into the world. And then uh, part of my experience is working with healthcare professionals as an educator. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on, you do this wonderful stuff, like everything that you've been saying today is just, uh, it's just healing words for me, uh, having been there. But I, I, I wonder what it's like for new graduates to go out into the world and be challenged by the, you know, the healthcare is a business, you know, and, and that it's, it, it's not, there isn't really a whole lot of support to be in these ways. Adrian, yes, go ahead. Well, we have a health economist, you know, miss, so I really shouldn't talk about that. Is I'm not the expert in this. But Ainsley, I can tell you that healthcare is in a significant crisis as we read day to day from the newspaper. And I think there's an appetite to change and there ought to change. We have to do better than what we do now. So this is the time for us as frontline practitioners as learner to influence the system. So we invite a lot of our guest speaker, our colleague that actually are on the sustainability committee at the health authorities. Um, they know this is not sustainable. How we do things is not sustainable. We have to change. So, you know, it never happens to me to be not optimistic around this subject, but I think that for us is to really take action and do what we need to do within our sphere of influence. Um, I, I, yeah, my, I would say that, um, you know, I think that's a really good question because oftentimes my colleagues at the front lines uh, who are working at the bedside will say, we'll push back. I've had a lot of pushback in general from uh, practitioners, but also from sometimes from colleagues who, you know, state that our curriculum is too packed, like there's no space for this. Um, it's not practical to teach about this. You know, we have to just focus on the biomedical model. And I will argue back and say, well, actually, the medical model is directly intertwined with, with the environmental aspect that people are situated in, as also Dr. Yi mentioned in his presentation. So there is no, my, my response is, there's no need to reinvent any wheels. The beauty of these concepts is that you can actually thread them throughout the existing curriculum by actually presenting case-based uh, stories, whether it is of a patient, for example, who's experiencing an extreme heat-related illness, and then you bring in all the, uh, all the components around that. So I would say that um, there's ways that we can train the next uh, generation of health professionals and also the one that's practicing right now through these kind of opportunities like Lunch and Learns, where, where you have... And I really think that universities and especially health related professional programs with health authorities um, and health organizations should find a bridging way to come together and build in professional development that actually relates to these topics. And I really, I am actually confident that this can happen. It's just tell me who I need to speak to and I would love to go in and give these conversations. It's just building those networking relationships that can address exactly what you're asking. Some thoughts. Any additional thoughts? We have we have three or maybe even four questions in the chat, so I might I might jump into there. Unless Peter, you want to make a comment on this topic? No, we're good. So, a question from Stephanie: I'm wondering how environmental health and environmental justice figures into the respective panelists' work with the intensification of toxic chemical and radiation exposures due to extreme weather events from climate change. Is the issue of accountability regarding those causing the exposures or those in positions to regulate industry ever discussed? S 
so I would let me just jump in on that one. I, absolutely. I mean, I, accountability uh, is an inevitable topic when one deals with um, global disparities and um, and the history that brought them about. And I think students see in front of you know our course this term was offered during COP27, and it was pretty clear that there was quite a lot of discussion about accountability going on before and during that, that meeting. Um, uh, so, I mean, a hearty yes. And, you know, it's, it's important to find a balance between um, the, the concern about accountability and bringing about greater justice and also a sense of a dynamic of positive change, because I do feel that um, our students are sometimes at risk of feeling that they, there may be little room for them to do anything for which they're not accountable for some injustice. And I, I think we should try to not allow that feeling to, to dominate the conversation. Okay. I wasn't sure. I was just yeah. going to say quickly that um, uh, the one thing that I find helps a lot is uh, in my in my course, I, I adopt the micro meso macro level approach. So I always talk about, OK, here are the big players. This is the, the level, the really broad level that, you know, when we think about the largest contributors in terms of specific industries or government based policies that may not necessarily promote health and well-being or consider uh, where the climate is going. Uh, but then here are the meso and the micro, which I really think that when we gear our attention to solutions built on those, people are better able to kind of uh, picture more feasible, realistic solutions that are right at their fingertips, or they can get engaged with community-based action. So I always try to bring it from, from the macro to, to the micro and try to explain that just because at the macro level, you might see something that can, le can lead you to feel despaired here's how you can get engaged and do this at the micro or the meso level. So it's always trying to twist the, the, to kind of provide both sides of the coin, but to give the actual one that can help them feel like they're doing something. So just wanted to add to that. Yeah, I want to jump in with a uh, reflection of this project that, that we have been or are working on. Um, for all the presentation that we do through the governance structure to get the curriculum approved. I don't do the presentation, it's Jenna and Crystal. And part of the curriculum or education that or coaching that I provide is how you work with a system, how you influence the system, and how you work with a team to maximize your influence. Uh, I see my job simplistically is actually get money to fund their summer work. And beyond that, they actually do all the work behind it. I provide the coaching and the feedback and get out of their way. <laughs> so this is part of, I, I think we have to really convey the message that um, this is not hopeless. We can always do what we can within the role that we play to further the goals along. But this has to start from individual level to a system level, to an organization level. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I have a couple of questions in the chat still, but I think Malcolm has raised his hand. Malcolm, do you have it? Is it a comment or question related to the accountability conversation? You're you're on mute. Yes. Um, Go ahead then. It's related. So when accountability sort of ties into the issue of hypocrisy, which I find engaging in this topic, I inevitably makes me aware that I'm basically living hypocritically in many ways. And, um, and one likes to get taught by people who are not hypocritical about what they're teaching. And I just wonder whether you've had those feelings yourself and uh, whether there's some way of 
articulating it so that the audience, the students, don't get disillusioned. Um, it, so I wondered, uh, it's a bit like how Adrian has been expressing it, namely, we don't, the health system crisis, everybody acknowledges, and we don't know the obvious solutions, but we're going to plow ahead. The, so the, the concept of humility is really important. But uh, I, the, the um, yeah, so I'll just leave that and see whether anybody has a way of navigating that. Thank you. Any takers for that one? I'm happy to take a crack at this question, but this is the perspective that I gained when I uh, um, discussed this exact issue with Courtney Howard. <laughs> so how do we role model this and how do we change our behavior so we are actually doing what we are teaching? Uh, it is actually really challenging. So uh, on a personal level, uh, I now travel a lot less than before by plane. And one of those things is clear is if I'm going to a conference, uh, if it's a, something that I present, then that has to be in person, right? Because you don't really offer a choice. But if something that for my learning, I, my preference is to engage it virtually so I can actually plan it to my, in my day. So I'm not sure how effective it is, but I do worry a bit about what I call not following your own advice around doing this. I don't think we'll never be perfect, right? That's the issue. Yeah. It's not about being perfect, but it's about tweaking your behavior so you can gradually work towards a goal. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Um, any other comments? I'm going to jump into one of the questions here by Jenna. Do you believe that there are some generic general purpose tools that need to be developed or incorporated by health professionals to integrate sustainability into practice? Um, so I feel like, so this current day, there are so many tools out there that are already developed and are fantastic resources. And so right now I'm kind of like at a point where I'm thinking, let's start putting our energy towards implementation. Like there's already the research is there, the tools are there. Let's figure out how to get this into practice. And I would say that from my personal experience as a nurse, I found that the best conversations I've had around this has been uh, brainstorming with other educators, uh, which I have the privilege to do through the Global Consortium for Climate and Health Education. We have a nursing working group. So we're a pretty global team, but we're talking about how we can approach the colleges, the regulatory colleges, the ones who essentially say what goes in curricula and what doesn't and what can get essentially transformed to competencies that then uh, health professionals can put into practice. So my personal opinion is that a lot of more effort and energy needs to be placed into those conversations so that we can actually see what we teach in the classroom become a competency that in standards of practice, at least I can speak from, from my nursing perspective, that are actually a part of the scope of practice uh, that's uh, in, implemented in, in the healthcare sector. But I wonder what my colleagues have to add on that. Yeah, I'll add a thought on that. I'm not sure uh, about uh, tools in the sense that we have, I agree with uh, Relika, that we have a lot of tools and they're not just technical tools. They're tools of understanding psychology, social behavior, culture, politics, and so on. Uh, I do think that um, UBC could do a better job of uh, building the bridges across these tools and the bridges between sectors like medicine, nursing, public health, and practice at the different levels, including, and as an economist, I have a particular my own personal interest really in more the macro and meso level. Um, and because, you know, the, the crises we're facing around the world in health and also in British Columbia really are not going to be addressed solely by improving micro level practice. 
Um, and, and we could do more to build these bridges, uh, even between public health, medicine, and nursing, but also policy, science, where the climate, a lot of the climate work is being done, and so on. Yeah, one of the roles that I have as the director of curriculum, I serve as the complaint department from various sector of the undergraduate program. One of the most common complaints from faculty is our learners are disengaged. And the questions that I always ask is, why do you think that's happening? So one of the recent example was a seminar that is two hours and it's a very dense one-way directions of content transfer. And the question that I asked was, when you go to a conference, ask my colleague, when you go to a conference, when do you start tuning out when the speakers speak? I think majority of us start tuning out at around 40 minutes if you are alert and have your coffee. And by around 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., it's probably 20 minutes at best. So I had the opportunity to uh, work with Jeff Miller uh, from CTLT when I did my Master's of Education Technology. I now gain the appreciation of constructivism. So this is where that I find all the existing tool needs to be adapted for your program. And the learner actually needs to do the work. They need to go through a problem set. They need to think it through and actually use the tool to generate their own meaning of the knowledge that they have. Actually start to learn to apply the tool. And this is when you can get that interest. Because if you just generate a whole bunch of PowerPoint, I can guarantee that five minutes after you're done with your lecture, they have no recollection. That, is, that sounds very true to me. Um, I'm going to move on to another question here by Ellison. Hi there, loving the discussions on the panel. I'm especially I'm a I am a specialty nursing educator focusing on faculty development in ER nursing. Also finishing my graduate studies in health leadership. My question is: How do you build sustainability change agents within students? Often when I bring this up, especially in nursing, my students are saying they can barely get enough staff or have even pee breaks, let, um, let alone think about planetary health. They recognize it is important, but when leadership isn't pushing for it, the students feel disempowered to move the dial. So how do we as educators motivate or champion them? Tough question. Let's start with uh, role modeling. And I, I know this sounds... Uh... You know, it's easy to say, uh, but I have spoken about this and actually I was very happy to be able to give a lecture in the relational ethical nursing practice course that I taught this term. So they're first term BSN students um, and there's no better time to influence people but at the beginning of their program, uh, but you have to be consistent. Um, so returning to role modeling, I think that when you share your story, so for instance, I talked a lot about how I came across this space, this topic. I moved away from joining a master's in nursing, wanting to do a full dissertation on the need to reform the Canadian Healthcare Act and switched 180 degrees and did it on climate change because I realized that nurses were not visible enough in these spaces. And I'm an advocate that more nurses need to be part of uh, government work, policy spaces and so forth. So by actually sharing that, you know, just like them, you know, I come through uh, completely not knowing, but immersing yourself in the knowledge. And if you even have a level of curiosity to want to learn, I think that's the first opportunity we have. And being able to share what you're doing with your life, what are the aspects and areas where you're engaged in, trying to help students find um, groups of people where they share their same values with them, uh, where they can essentially champion the, the, the actual issues they care about and then trying to connect them with the clinical setting. So for instance, in BC, we have BC Green Care um, and they're a fantastic organization because they actually help um, health professionals in the clinical settings uh, create green teams, try to champion sustainability related issues on their units. So there is a way for students to actually become involved with this if they're actually receive the education and the awareness about all of these other uh, organizations uh, who are actually there for that support. Um, so I know it sounds easier said than done, but I've been through a lot of what you're sharing, uh, Ellison, uh, in, in that, you know, you get pushback from the students or from faculty because there's always something else that's more important. 
Uh, but I always come back to, you know, if we don't address the climate change related crisis, then we're going to be bound to fail in addressing the other crises. So it's just it's it's how we harness our energy and how we try to create uh, opportunity and spaces for conversations. And if it means like creating a committee or a, a I don't know, a book club, for instance, somebody gave me the idea where you pick a climate related book and you bring the students who are curious about this and you have those critical conversations. I don't see how that wouldn't necessarily transform into a, one of two of those students becoming change agents. So um, that's something that's at least worked for me, but I'm happy to connect with you if you want. Adrian or Peter, any comments on that? Yeah, I don't have a uh, solution to the issue that we are dealing with. Um, the healthcare system is just really busy with everyone around and uh, um, it's challenging. Uh, what we try our best is to um, develop a network and space for learners to explore different topics. So in our degree program, we have a flex project. So flex project is they can work with uh, many colleagues and develop the area of the interest and they get to meet um, a wider variety of clinician or researcher or health administrators. So really understand multiple perspectives. So for example, if they are interested in a project in quality improvement, they will be connected to Malcolm uh, to get to know who's Malcolm, what project is he working on and how does Malcolm see the world and become part of the mentorship. So I don't have a quick fix. I think we are in a bit of rough patch for the next year or two years or maybe the next five years, but gradually with time, I think we do have to make the long-term investment on change uh, because if we don't change, we'll never get there. I would just add that I like the role modeling idea. And I think that it's kind of important to um, um, bring in voices that are involved in practice um, and also voices from different, uh, you know, from different generations. Um, one of the, if you've been doing this as long as I have, one of the interesting things is you see those students that you had a couple of decades ago suddenly are the change agents. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I think everybody can find the space to practice change wherever they are. Uh, and bringing in those examples, I think is great. Thank you, Peter and Adrian and Raluca. Um, I missed a question that was in the chat, just found it here. We, I think we addressed part of it, but I'll, I'll just put it forward again to see if there's any other any other insight into this. There's a question from Candice. She says, a number of students have expressed hopelessness regarding the climate crisis and concern over what they perceive as lack of meaningful actions in society overall. So many people are experiencing what can be immobilizing stress or fear. How do you approach teaching, engaging students on these topics with this in mind? We sort of talked about this a bit. Is there anything you do or recommend in the short term, in a given moment, in a given class, which is, I, th I think, an interesting question. Over several sessions, example, over a course, hope may build, but I'm wondering how we can best bridge from that fear and how agency, rather than fear, can be sustained after a course. Sorry, long question. I have to say, I think that to me, that's one of the most disturbing things to uh, encounter uh, today and that I don't have a solution for it, but I do think that um, sharing examples of positive change and modeling that optimis optimism and commitment to bring about change, even small change at the margin is mm -hmm. one of the ways that we struggle against that pessimism and despair, um, because giving into the pessimism and despair will create the situation that we want to avoid. So I think we just need to keep hammering at it. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to add to that, um, I, I'm going to go to an example. I know I've shared this with, with you in the chat, but just to, I wanted to speak a little bit about that as a resource, because I think it's very powerful. And the reason why it's powerful is because it was developed uh, by a uh, the past TA, uh, the teaching assistant for the course, and also one of the students I, I co-supervised for her uh, pro final project. And it's basically 
Um, she created a toolkit that, again, engages students in reflective based exercises. Uh, they get to select. So it's about learning about eco anxiety, eco grief, um, and trying an eco paralysis. And uh, there's an accompanying documentary, 25 minute long, that she also produced. And she's a nurse, double master's, and master's in nursing and master in public health. So she's a really, uh, really smart uh, individual. But the fact that it's actually developed by a student with student voices integrated. Um, I had the privilege to be in the film, but also Dr. Melissa Lim and Dr. Courtney Howard were, were in the film as well. Um, but again, because you have a tool and a resource that's created by a student for students, I think that is kind of like a legacy that lives on and that also empowers every cohort of students who comes across that to engage with those topics, to break the stereotypes, uh, especially with respect to the language that we're becoming used to with these uh, eco-environmental related uh, mental health, um, uh, we call them psychotratic syndromes. Um, but it's, I think it can be very powerful when, when students work and student voices are the ones that help to champion how people kind of engage with these topics and to break, uh, to break the feelings that paralysis kind of tends to cause when we're so, ex so exposed to these topics in the media and just creating conversation again in class to try to steer away from scrolling too much through social media, but rather taking a break, going outdoors. Um, I would had the privilege to have somebody from Parks uh, Canada come and speak to who works very closely with Dr. Melissa Lim. And she actually walked us down to Rec Beach. And so engaging in those actual, again, experiential learning, moving outside the classroom and actually connecting with nature and learning why we need to protect it um, can again move students from that anxious state into more a more where they're feeling one with nature. Great, thank you. And, and I can add also that what, one of the one of the teams that's part of our unit at the Sustainability Hub is the Climate Hub, and the Climate Hub offers a ton of resources for students, uh, including uh, spaces for conversations, or climate climate conversations. Um, and and a number of yeah tools and resources that students and and faculty can use uh, in these difficult times. Let's see. Are there any other questions in the chat? I don't. I see some comments. No. No other questions. Um, one that was coming to mind um, as I listened to you share your experience developing all these new curriculums and content. What were the what were the main challenges you faced and would have you done anything differently now that you've gone through that process or are going through that process? Any, any sort of tips and tricks and lessons that you would share with other people in, in their room today? Sounds like it went perfectly, perfectly well. Adrian? I think the key part for me is um, demonstrating that this the success of the program is not just about the design of a workshop voila we are done after we have a workshop no this is an area is the ongoing change because i have no doubt a year from now our perspective will change again and how we approach it technology will change the conversation will change is actually require ongoing adaptation ongoing review of the curriculum uh, it's not a static curriculum I would just add that um, it takes it takes extra additional effort to involve practitioners outside of the university in and to equitably and um, responsibly create jointly developed learning materials, especially if you want to share them across different environments. Um, so, you know, this, th this is something one needs to respect the fact that this does take effort, time, energy, not just resource, you know, financial resources. And, you know, we need to kind of uh, acknowledge and reward that when, when, when that effort is made by the students or their professors or whomever. Uh yeah, I think a final, I, I want to share, I think the, my biggest challenge has been, and it's, it's a challenge slash a question. Um, I can't understand, I think for me, moving the past the siloing, because still there's a lot of work that happens in silo. And uh, I think we touched upon this. All of us have talked about coming together, finding ways to bridge this work, to stop working kind of in, 
in different groups, but rather bring our energies into one space. And I've said this before, and I've said it again, and if this is the right place to say it, I think UBC should, should have a, a, like the house where you have the climate change center or the, the Institute for climate and resources, like everything combined in one place so that faculties from across, like if we're just talking from an educational perspective, everybody from across uh, disciplines can come in the same place because otherwise there's, there's work happening in forestry, there's work happening in geography that you never hear about. And having a single kind of institute or center uh, for research, for, for real life kind of community-based work, I think would really help bring us cl closer together to actually attaining that strategic vision that we've committed to as a university. And then taking that and applying it to uh, our communities and our local contexts that are also doing the work. So I think for me, that has been probably the biggest challenge to navigate is having to write up emails to different people from different specialties and then feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable because you have to really step outside your comfort zone to reach out to people who maybe are working government at really high level or people you never thought you'd have a conversation with, but just, it takes a lot of courage. And I agree. I think the time component on top of like, I have a hundred percent teaching assignments. So this has been kind of like an additional, you know, sometimes even 20 hours a week on top of everything else. But when you have the passion and you want to make that change, I think it's just trying to get really creative and uh, not being afraid that, you know, you're not going to know everything. So just really welcoming uh, all the knowledge and absorbing it like a sponge. Thank you. And that's very valuable feedback as well. At the Sustainability Hub, we are trying to create that that space that that centralizes these resources and that can create those spaces that can create connections between people from across disciplines. And we're, we're working on that. And maybe one thing I would recommend, if you have a few extra hours a month, Raluca, <laughs> is there's an interdepartmental climate committee uh which is a or group that formed organically through the the department of geography and uh asian studies and the library and now it's starting to include people from other faculties and other departments that are getting together once a month to to learn about what other others are doing and this includes faculty staff and students typically graduate students um who have committees or are creating committees in their own department. So there is a, there is a bit of a, an energy in, in terms of coming together from, from across disciplines. And the climate emergency team is situated within the sustainability hub as well. And they're trying to uh, bring people together from across campus as well. And that, so that maybe is a good point here to share my, my screen very quickly, um, just to show you, oops. Just one second. You see, you see a slide now with resources. Yeah. So this is these are just a few resources that are available at the Sustainability Hub for for faculty and for students as well. But mostly, this conversation is about how to support faculty. So you can find this at sustain.ubc.ca/faculty. A number of grants, uh, the events that we have to bring faculty together workshops, um, some research grants as well, not only teaching and curriculum development plans, but also some research support. Um, so I recommend, and if you, if you want to also empower your students further, there are a number of programs that we have for students. So I, I recommend that you visit this, this webpage. And also the climate emergency has a whole set of actions that are um, recommended for faculty members and staff and students on, on campus to, to help us meet our goals. Um, for the next few years. So feel free to contact us as well for this. And uh, let's see, what is the time? I think we're getting close to time, yes. Are there any other questions um, in the chat or anybody who has a question, please raise your hand. I know, I know that uh, Ainsley shared a feedback form. So if you have a couple of minutes to do that. But I, I don't, I don't see any additional questions coming in. I want to thank um, Peter, Raluca, and Adrian so much for being here and sharing this incredible experience and the incredible work that you do um, with all of us today. I'm sure you're available. I know you're busy, but available. If people have questions for any of you or questions for the Sustainability Hub, please feel free to contact us. 
Um, I hope you took a lot out of this session. And I want to thank the CTLT once again for allowing us to, to have these conversations. And hopefully in the next institutes that you host, either the Spring Institute or next year's Winter Institute, we'll have more to share with the UBC community. I'll leave this slide open here in case anybody wants to uh, copy those, those links. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and definitely be in touch if you wanna have more of these conversations or looking for resources, uh, please, yeah, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thanks, everyone.